Good morning. This is Matthias again at the Carolina Raptor Center. Today I would like to talk to you about banding raptors here at the Carolina Raptor Center. So banding has been around for a long time. Scientists, researchers have banded birds for over a hundred years now. And since then, more than 60 million birds have been banded all over the country and Canada. Um, and this, this uh, right now, currently, at, at least one million more birds are banded each year by scientists. So you, you, the reason we ban birds, the reason scientists started banning birds, is they want to find out more about what these birds are doing. Uh, things like how long do they live, where do they go, do they come back to the same places, their family life, for instance, do the parents stay together, do they come back to the same location, how far do the young travel, and so all kinds of questions you can answer by banding individual birds with these metal bands, and I'll show you some details in a minute. Um, so you have to have a permit to band birds, and we've been fortunate here at Carolina Raptor Center that since inception we've always had uh, a bander on staff, and currently on this at this time, Carolina Raptor Center actually itself has a banding permit, as a station permit it's called. Um, so why are we banding birds? Here you see a little screech owl about to be released. Um, you can't see his legs, but he's got a band on. Um, we want to find out the same things that scientists in general want to find out, but specifically dealing with our rehabilitation program is were we successful? Did the birds live for a decent amount of time after we had released them? Um, you know, again, same questions. How long do they live? How far do they travel? Do they come back to the same areas? That type of thing. So it really tells us if we're doing a good job or not. So it's great to get banned returns in some ways. So that's what we call a bird that comes back to us. Either we get the bird back or we get a report about the band. Um, it's kind of good news, bad news. Um, because if a bird was seen again, Sometimes that means it's just observed, but sometimes that means it is deceased. It was injured again or found deceased somewhere, and someone reported it. Um, so are there are different types of bands. Matthias, do we band all of our birds? We do not. Excellent question, yes. Um, so most birds can tolerate bands, but there are some exceptions. Vultures, for instance, have an unusual habit of urinating on their legs. Um, which, if you put a band on that leg, will get crusty and encased in, well, pretty disgusting stuff, pretty quickly. So vultures automatically cannot be banded. They found this out the hard way over the years, when they first started banding birds, and they didn't know enough about them, basically. Um, there are also some birds who don't seem to tolerate these bands very well. We find this out in captivity because when we have a group of hawks or owls together in a flight cage, we have to be able to mark them in some way so we can tell who's who. So we have five red-tailed hawks together, for instance. They each have to have a metal band on, a temporary band, so we can tell who's who. Um, well, sometimes the birds will tell us right away they don't like these bands. They start picking at them, literally picking at them, and they can injure their legs pretty severely if we don't catch it early enough. So some birds just don't like jewelry, basically. And so we can't, we can't band those when we release them, which is unfortunate means we don't get any data out of those birds, but obviously it's for the sake of the bird, for its safety, it's the better solution to this problem. Um, so here you see uh, us applying a band to a bird's leg just before release. And here are some examples. So they, they make at least three different types of bands that we use, um, and it's based on the size of the bird and also their strength. So the smallest birds, get something like this, which is called a butt end bird, and yes, that is butt, B-U-T-T, -T, <laughs> because the ends of the band literally butt up against each other. This will be for the smallest birds who don't have a very strong beak. For the medium-sized birds, like barred owls, red tails, great horned owls, they get this type of bird band, which is called a lock-on band, because that little lip is bent over, and that way the band can't be removed nearly as easily as, a, as the, the butt end. And that's the, see, the kind you see over here on this red-tailed hawk. You see the lip that's not quite been bent over yet. So that works for most of the medium-sized birds. However, we've got some really big birds who have very strong beaks. So that includes the eagles, for instance. Their bands have to be riveted in place because they could tear these bands up. These are made out of aluminum in most cases, a pretty soft, lightweight metal. Um, 
an eagle could potentially damage this over the course of weeks and months. And ideally, of course, these can stay on for the bird for years to come, for its lifetime. Um, and again, the, you know, the size and diameters have been experimented with over time, so that we came up with the safest types to put on each bird. And each specific species has a certain size band that it takes. So we put these on. Over the course of our history, we've put on over 8,000 bird bands, birds that have been released. Um, and we've gotten actually more than 600 of them back. And again, good news, bad news, but we learned something from those bands. Um, do we, we have a question. Do we know the oldest bird that has been a band we return? do. Our oldest bird, yes. In fact, let me show you if I can find that slide. Yes. So barred owls is one of our most common patients, and barred owls also happens to be, i got to find my mouse, where'd it go? Barred owl also happens to be the most common recovery. Um, so here is a graph, so you have to know a couple things. Here are the different species, and there are fortunately the abbreviations. This is what the American Ornithological Union and we use to denote each bird. This, for instance, is a great horned owl, barred owl, red-tailed hawk. Pardon me. Um, so you notice on this graph it tells you the higher the bar, the older the bird. So at some point we had a great horned owl that was recovered 20 years later after we banded it. However, very urgent update. Um, so we actually have what we believe is now the oldest known barred owl in the United States that wow. we have recovered. There's an owl that came to us back in 19... Oh my God, wait a minute. I can find him. I think it was 1985. His number is 3833. So that tells you something because his new number, when he was found again, it was number 22,150. So about 18,000, no, 19,000 19, birds later, something like that. Um, he was found 25 years plus later. And he'd only traveled half a mile, give or take, <laughs> in that whole time. This was a really cool case. Um, again, good news, bad news. The original injury was he was trapped in a chimney. You know how barred owls look at a chimney as a nest cavity, so to speak. So early in the year, they look for nest sites, and some of them fall down into a chimney, can't, uh, can't get back out on their own. We got a call from this homeowner in Statesville. We drove up there, we got the owl out. It was fine. We banded it and released it in the same neighborhood because he's a, lo a local resident bird there. So 25 plus years later, he was found in the same neighborhood, half a mile away, <laughs> wow. which is pretty amazing. And the, of course, the only way we know it was the same bird is because it had that one unique band on. Each band has a unique number. It also has contact information. So if anybody finds this band anywhere in the United States, Canada, Central America, South America, wherever it ends up, they can report this on a, on a website and we get a we get an email basically saying, your owl was found. So that's pretty cool. That is our oldest recovery. Um, not all of them live that long, unfortunately. Um, and again, it tells us something about, you know, where do they go, how, how long do they live. Uh, let me tell you about a couple of other birds here. Uh, got myself a sheet. Is number five. Let's see if number five tells me what I need. Oh, no. So here's the species we already talked about. So barred owls is the most often recovered. More than 200 barred owls we've gotten back. So it makes sense. The more common the bird, barred owl, red-tailed hawk, great horned owl, cooper's hawk, the more common the bird, the more likely we'll get it back because we banned more of them so the chance of recovery is greater. Let me go to a really interesting case way down at the bottom. Um, the longest distance traveled. So some of our birds are migratory. Some of them like to stick around year round, but some of them are migratory. That includes broad-winged hawks. Um, so here are all the broad-winged hawks that we recovered. Um, so here's North Carolina, Charlotte. Quite a few of them are close by, but there's a few of them that traveled quite a ways. One ended up in Miami, Florida. Another one in uh, Mexico. This bird traveled from the Charlotte area to Mexico in something like 16 days. <sighs> So broadwing hawks are known for migration. Every fall they head to Central and South America, they come back in the spring, and he was no exception. So we think he could fly pretty good to make it that far in 
just over two weeks. Uh, let me see. We also have, so sometimes the news is not bad. If they're found again, it doesn't automatically mean they're injured. In some cases, we've had some that have been found multiple times, including a bar dial that was found in several chimneys. Let's see if I can find him. Yeah, here he is. So here's our friend, the barred owl. And you can see, this is actually not the bird, but here's a barred owl with a band on. So if you're lucky, if you have a good spotting scope or binoculars, sometimes you can read the entire number of this band, and you may not have to have the bird in your hand to be able to read the number. We get some reports like that. But here's a barred owl that came to us five times <laughs> over the course of seven years. And he was all found in the same neighborhood. This is right in Charlotte, in a busy residential area in five different chimneys. And there's actually a, another date that we think he was removed from a chimney without us knowing about it by a local resident there. Um, this bird did not learn its lesson. <laughs> this is why we encourage homeowners to cap their chimneys. Mm -hmm. uh, it keeps all kinds of wildlife out, not just owls, but squirrels, maybe even chimney swifts, depending on what you put up there. Because um, they can all potentially ha have problems or cause you to have problems. Um, yeah, this bird did not learn his lesson. Kept <laughs> trying to nest in chimneys. Oh, uh, let's see, what else do we have? Oh yeah, I was going to show you. So some of these results are pretty interesting, what we've learned from our data. So this shows you how long they lived after they left here. These are these 600 birds we've gotten back over the years. These are young birds, what we call local or hatching year birds. They lived on average 300 days before they got injured again or were reported again. The adult birds lived on average more than twice as long, 680 birds. We kind of knew this intuitively. Adult birds are more experienced, so after they've been through the rehabilitation process, um, their chances of living past this injury are better because they were experienced to start with, whereas young birds always have a harder time in the beginning. There's a pretty steep learning curve with young birds. Unfortunately, some of them don't make it through their first winter. That is Mother Nature kind of trying to make sure that the species stays strong. The strongest survive, some of the weaker ones do not. So that's a good example of uh, showing up in our banding records. And then the other one I was going to show you is, because it's also pretty striking. Um, is everybody familiar with nocturnal versus diurnal? Birds that are active at night versus birds that are active during the day. And there's a pretty significant difference. Notice the sample size is almost the same, 258 versus 315. The diurnals, hawks, etc., traveled quite a bit further. Over 50 miles on average was the recovery distance, as opposed to owls, less than 10 miles. This is also something we kind of suspected based on what we've been reading, what we've been told by other people, that owls in general are more sedentary, at least the ones in our area in the Carolinas. There are some species of owls that are migratory, especially the further north you go. Um, hawks, some are sedentary and some are migratory, so this would include things like broad-winged hawks, the ospreys. So some of those species kind of skew this to you know, make it look that different, but that's pretty typical of what we think we was happening and we, we kind of suspected and it's been confirmed. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about something else. So besides banding, there's another way to track birds. Banding is an easy and cheap way, but unfortunately it doesn't give you much data because what are the chances that this bird will be seen again or found again? Less than 10% we found out. This is nationally true. Less than 10% of all banded birds are found. Um, there are other ways to track birds, including types of transmitters. This is a radio transmitter, um, and this is a satellite transmitter. I'm going to show you a case on that has this one on. So this is one that's relatively cheap, only $100, $200, but it means you have to be relatively close to the bird to follow it. And once the battery runs out, that's it. This will just fall off. You see the harness that's left on it. The bird would wear this on its back, like a backpack with the antenna sticking out toward the tail end. Same thing with this transmitter. This would sit on the birds. I'll show you a picture of an actual bird that's wearing one of these. Sit on the bird's back. You see the solar panel. This is how the battery is recharged. 
So it's one of the big differences between the radio transmitters and these satellite or cell phone transmitters. Um, they can last forever, potentially. Not forever, but years. Uh, and again, an antenna, so they can communicate with the outside world. So let's go to a case that we had a couple of years back. Matthias, can you, can you microchip a bird? Um, you probably could. I don't think anybody's doing that. Um, their skin is very thin, so if you just put a microchip under the skin, you could literally still see it, and it's not very protected. So I suppose it'll have to go under the muscle. Uh, but then you'd have to have the bird in hand to scan it, like you would a cat or a dog, to find out um, if that's your hawk or your owl. Uh, I'm not aware of anybody doing that currently, just because you have better ways to doing this. Some are not invasive, for instance, or you don't even have to have the bird in your hand, such as with these transmitters. You just need to know the general area, or you get an email report every day saying, here's your bird. I'll show you what that looks like. Um, let's take a look at number 41. So, four years ago, oh, I lost my magazine. Four years ago, we admitted a little eagle, an eagle baby that was born locally. Uh, our resident eagles fostered it for a couple weeks until it was big enough, and then he was released. And that, that's actually the bird right there. Um, he was called Freedom. There's his number. If anybody followed him on Raptor Med, that like, might look familiar. There's his transmitter. It's a little bit different from the one I showed you, but similar design. Um, and you can actually see it on the bird. There's the antenna sticking out. You see the solar panel. So it's kind of tucked away between the feathers. There's enough exposed so that the sunlight will hit it. So that is the actual bird uh, on the day that we put this transmitter on. Um, and he was released in 2016, in June of 2016. Here he is in 2018. Same bird. The reason we know is that the photographer was able to get close-up pictures of the band from all sides and was able to read the number and it had the transmitter on the back, so she contacted us. So Can you talk cool. about why, why these two pictures look so different? Yes. Um, so um, if you've seen a bald eagle, and I'm sure most of you have, an image of a bald eagle, a picture somewhere, a drawing, Notice that they have a white head and a white tail. Well, they're not born with that or hatched with that. Uh, when they're about three months old, this is what they look like. They're fully grown, they're as big as the adult bird, but there's no white head and no white tail. They're basically a solid brown bird. It will take them four to six years, four to six molting cycles, to turn from this into the typical image that you think about when you think bald eagle. So that's how you can age an eagle to some extent. If you notice this image, he's two years old there. He's changing colors, everything's changing. But the wing feathers, the body feathers, the beak even is changing, the eye color is changing. And after five years, uh, in fact, I'm gonna show you another picture of him. Let me get to wrap the mat for just a second. So I've got Freedom's chart right here. So here he is. Uh, a couple of days ago. Same bird. His beak is almost yellow, a little bit of dirty yellow. You notice the transmitter still in place. Again, same eagle because again, the photographer in this case, a different photographer, was able to see the band and read the numbers and contact us. How long will we expect that transmitter to last on this bird? Um, it, you know, theoretically four to six years, I think, is what we expected and we were hoping for. So we are now at four years, which is great. Um, anything beyond this is just icing on the cake. We'd love to see how he travels from here on out. Um, in case you're wondering, um, here is where he is currently as of a few days ago. Near Lake Erie, near Akron, Ohio, Youngstown, that's where he's hanging out. Every one of these purple dots is one location. So this transmitter communicates with local cell towers and downloads data, and then we get an email from, from the uh, company that monitors these signals, and they give us this map every day. So we can follow him literally every day, like hourly, um, to know exactly where he is. So we could literally find this bird if we needed to. If there was a problem, we suspect something's happening, like he's not moving for several days in a row, exactly in the same spot, that would tell us uh, there's probably a problem. Unless, for instance, let's say he's nesting. 
a couple of years down the road, he'll be old enough and he might be sitting in a nest incubating and that would be one reason why he's not moving. So that's the advantage of this type of transmitter versus just putting a band on a bird. We get a huge amount of data without having to do anything. There's unfortunately an upfront cost, which is the big difference. You know, bands are basically free. You know, the other transmitter type is $100, $200. This transmitter costs easily two to $3,000. And then there's a monthly or quarterly maintenance fee to deal with the data that's being downloaded. But the, the amount of data we get is, is huge. So we're very excited about Freedom still hanging on to this transmitter. Mm -hmm. So the transmitter on Freedom, was it the backpack style? It was the backpack style, yep. And it, it's, on, it's put on by a harness, which will eventually disintegrate. So my guess is the harness will fall off before the transmitter dies. Because that, that fabric is designed to not impede its movement and attached so that it'll eventually fall off. So that fabric is going to rot sooner or later. It's specially designed material, but still, it's not going to last forever. Um... That's oh, all cool. I have for now. Do you have any other questions? No, this was great. Thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. All Thanks. right. We'll see you next time. Okay, bye-bye.